My name is Fernando Branco. I'm a professor at the Institute of International Relations at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro here in Brazil. I'll be presenting the panelists. They will have 15 minutes each to make the presentation. This panel is called uh, Finance for New Challenges, and we do have another speaker, a new one. We are glad for it to make things more balanced for the rest of the day. So here on my right, uh, we have Professor Carlos Aguiar de Medeiros, who is a development economist and a professor emeritus at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro here in Brazil. Uh, here we have Professor Vikas Harawal. He's a professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. He's a member of the Executive Committee of the uh, International Development Economics Association, the ideas. And uh, we do have Professor, the new appointed here, uh, Professor Jose Miguel uh, Almada. He's assistant professor at the Institute of International Studies at the University in Chile. And he's a former Chilean vice trade minister. Okay, so we can start with the uh, order on the panel. So we can start with Professor Vickers. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, everyone, for for so. yeah for for this opportunity. Uh, coming on the third day after all these profound discussions, it's not an easy task. But at least that's a good better excuse than I would have had to give on the first day if I had to present. Then I would have said I don't know very much. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, in my presentation, I'm just going to be talking about. sets of things. The first set of things are really, you know, a small subset of things that have been talked about a lot. So, I mean, there's no particular reason for me to present those, but I'm just doing it because I've got some nice maps to show. So, um, I mean, if you basically over the last, um, yeah, sorry. Um, how does one use this? Yeah, okay. Over the last four decades, the hegemony of global finance and international financial institutions has become a key constraint on for less, less developed countries. Among other implications, increased trade and financial integration into the world economy has compromised the ability of countries in the global south to mobilize domestic investment, mobilize domestic resources for social protection, you know, preventing deprivation and food insecurity, ensuring access to basic amenities like clean water, sanitation, electricity, basic services like healthcare and education. And in many cases, it has actually compromised national sovereignty. Now, over only a few countries in East Asia, uh, most notably China, have managed to escape this to some extent and chalk out, chalk out a sort of different path of industrialization and economic development. Um, this map shows the, um, that essentially, you know, with, you know, barring some exceptions, uh, less developed countries, the global south is an exporter of raw materials and an importer of, uh, of finished goods, consumer goods and capital goods and services. Um, and uh, something similar is shown in the next graph where I, I show that Western Europe and Japan export finished goods and import raw materials. That's also the case for East, East and Southeast Asia. But if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, it's exactly the, the reverse. They export raw material and import uh, finished goods. Uh, if you look at FDI, I mean, FDI basically is not an engine of growth for the global south. Um, bulk of FDI flow, if you look at the graph on the right, bulk of the FDI flows are in uh, to, into the north, within the north sort of uh, investment from, from one country to another. If you look at less developed countries, particularly LDCs, I mean, FDI is only a trickle. Um, global manufacturing is... Uh, concentrated in the North and in China. Uh, there's been a decline in the share of US and Europe and a sort of corresponding rise in the share of, of China. But rest of the global South, I mean, you look at uh, Africa or South Asia in particular, Africa and South Asia in particular, very low, low levels of, uh, of uh, uh, industrialization. Um, now, 
Yeah. Now, in that situation where the Global South's own sort of economic uh, abilities, economic uh, uh, capacity has been constrained as part of this whole process of uh, of uh, integration into the world economy, you, I mean, you have a situation where the Global South also has to deal with some of these new emerging challenges. And I'm going to focus essentially on uh, on issues around climate finance. Uh, so, so that brings me to the main points that I want to make on, on this issue. Now, this table shows the, um, the requirement of uh, uh, climate finance. Yeah. Now, there are different numbers that are thrown. These numbers come from reports that are filed by developing countries to the U UNFCC and are reflect the requirement of climate finance for mitigation and adaptation in the developing countries. Now, the two main numbers come from the reports called national communications, which is in the range of about $9 trillion, billion dollars, $9, nine trillion dollars. And there are the NDCs, which is in the range of six, five point eight. Uh, six trillion dollars. So, you know, there is a huge requirement of climate finance. We are talking about climate finance required for dealing with climate change in the less developed countries in global south. Now, in these reports, admittedly by UNFCC, there is a huge underestimation because of gaps of reporting. Many countries simply, now these nationally determined uh, contributions are essentially costing of requirements of funds for various kinds of things. And many countries simply can't do the costing and there are huge gaps. And because of those gaps, the total resource requirement, particularly for adaptation, is supposedly hugely understated because many countries simply don't have the numbers. Uh, now, I mean, let's just look at these numbers, okay? Now, what is the what are the numbers about availability of climate finance? And uh, Lavinia has talked about some of those issues, so I'm going to have some overlap, but I think there are a few points that I want to make in addition. Now, here is are the numbers from the UNFCC Standing Committee on Finance. Okay, now these are annual numbers and we are talking about, so if you look at 2020, sorry, if you look at 2020, uh, oh God, this is not the right presentation, I'm afraid. Okay, I'll, I'll, sorry. All right. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just read out the numbers. If you look at the UNFCC Standing Committee on Finance, if you look at the annual availability of climate finance, you have numbers like $600 billion a year. Okay, now one would think that if your requirement is, you know, $5 trillion or $7 trillion, $8 trillion, and you're getting $6 billion every, uh, $600 billion every year, you know, over a period of a you know, 10 years or so, you would actually get that much money. But there is a problem in what you're saying here. Now, when UNFCC uh, Standing Committee on Finance talks of, of climate finance, they're actually adding up all expenditure by public and private sector, which is estimated to have some impact on climate. Okay, now you're not even making a distinction between business as usual and incremental expenditure that is being made, which basically means that all spending by governments, all spending by businesses, which has any implication for climate change, even in a business as usual scenario, is counted as climate finance. So there is a huge overstating of money that is being put for dealing with climate change. This is not money being put for dealing with climate change. This is all the money that is any bearing on climate change. Okay, so there is a huge overstatement in terms of uh, this availability of climate finance. If you look at the 
the UNFCC Standing Committee on Finance. In fact, if you look at those numbers regionally, the largest contribution of that comes from developing countries and among them about a fourth come, a third to a fourth in different years comes from the BRICS countries. So essentially what you have is a large amount of spending in developing countries is just being accounted for as climate finance and is being treated as as uh, money that's going to deal with climate change while when you did the estimation of of requirements this was incremental expenditure that was required with de dealing with climate change uh, now let me show you some numbers uh, from the major funds and this is sort of in sort of relates to the points that uh, lavinia made uh, there is a huge discrepancy in the commitment that is made and the actual disbursement that is made. If you look at global environment facility, the commitment is to the tune of $25 billion. Now, firstly, one has to understand that now that's the money that the global north is putting in for spending in developing countries. And the, now we are talking of numbers that are way too, you know, much smaller than the requirements. So the requirements was like five to eight trillion dollars. We are talking about commitment of 25 billion dollars. Okay. Now of that 25 billion dollars, the latest data I could get for 2023 shows that the actual disbursement is only about nine billion dollars. Okay, so that's the total amount of disbursement that has happened through global environment facility. If you look at Glo Green Climate Fund, this is in fact uh, the, the graphs that Lavinia had also shown that, uh, you know, of the commitment of $11 billion under Green Climate Fund, the actual disbursement is only about $3.9 uh, billion. So once again, you find that the actual disbursement is much lower than the commitment that is made by the Global North. Uh, so there is a staggering gap in between the needs and availability of finance for developing countries to meet the, these new challenges. The gap is hugely understated in the data because of underestimation of needs and overstatement of availability in terms of commitments over actual disbursements. The economic constraints developing countries face are faced with limit the prospects of domestic mobilization of resources for dealing, I mean, if one's talking of incremental uh, resource mobilization for dealing with these new challenges, that potential as we've sort of, of the various things that we've discussed over the last two reasons, two days, I mean, there are huge constraints that developing countries face in, in, in mobilizing. In the meanwhile, vast mass, masses of people in the less developed countries are actually already facing the heat because of the climate change. Now, there is, in fact, a new twist in the tale, uh, uh, in this tale, which is that on, so, you know, this, this problem of global north not meeting its commitment of, you know, shelling out money to deal with climate change is not a new story. I mean, since 1997 Kyoto Protocol days, this has been the story. The, the, you know, the global north has, has not met the commitment. But what you now find is that, not only you're not meeting the commitment, you're actually trying to pass off the burden. Now, I'll give you an example here. Now, if you look at the, you know, how things have changed in assessment of agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gases. Okay, from uh, IPCC's AR4, agriculture contributed 10 to 12% of total greenhouse gas emissions. AR5, this is raised to 13 to 21%. 2019 IPCC special report takes it up to 23%. FAO 2023 report on, on climate change takes it up to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. So there is an increase in the contribution of agriculture to greenhouse gas emissions. And how is this coming about? This is coming about by increasing the estimation of the agriculture in global south that its contribution to, to greenhouse gas emissions. So now, basically what you're saying is that subsistence activities in global south are, are a major source of, of greenhouse gas emissions. The share of Europe, North America and Oceania in global greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture has fallen from 29% in 1990 to 22% in 2020. 
20, in 2020 and there's corresponding rise in the share of the global south. Subsistence agriculture, most importantly rice production and small scale livestock farming are condemned to be the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Now, what, what does that mean? Use of mineral fertilizers. So if you use urea, you're contributing to greenhouse gases. If you use organic manures, you're contributing to greenhouse gases. So basically, you can neither do organic agriculture nor use modern chemical fertilizer. Now, if that's going to be what you're going to be doing, and if if rice consumption in tropical areas is 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 condemned to be a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, I don't know what we are going to do what the world is going to do to feed itself. So you have a problem where Global North has historically not met its commitment of giving out uh, finance for dealing with climate change. And there is this new strategy of actually passing off the burden of it itself to the Global South. So that's the point that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, for ideas. Um, well, this is a big conference, and then I realized, seeing my presentation, that a lot has been said already. So, but maybe some of you have not so good memory. I don't have, so maybe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I can say something that uh, could be um, important to me. Uh, what's my, my, my PowerPoint? Is? No. This, um, Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, this is a big agenda, but uh, I will be very, very brief with this. Yeah, you yes, press the right. Point it to the side. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I would say that this, uh, remember Charles Kinderberg, Angwin in his analysis of the 30s, the United States, although economically dominant, failed to act as an hegemon by not providing financial support for international economic stability. And the purpose of Bretton Woods institutions were to fill this gap. But as a matter of fact, they never did. But the Cold War created development environments. Nowadays, they are even weaker. The economic dominance of the United States has declined and the development environment is no more led by the United States. Some common and well-ground reforms that we discussed here along this seminar uh, as the enlargement and redistribution of special drawn rights for developed countries, more concession loans for poor countries, higher engagement of China and participation of non-Western development countries in monetary and finance system have been highlight international political economy. But they collide with the interests of the United States that historically subordinate IMF to the uh, United uh, Treasury and asserting veto power on decisions and controls over World Bank. But this is a phrase, there is no parallel universe. He, um, I think that the person that has said this for the first time was the last president of this uh, new developed bank from the BRICS. Despite the decline of the Bretton Institutions, 
And despite the dollar, weaponization used large scale against Russia. The United States dollar still is the dominant currency in the actual monetary system. So far, the rise of China did create a regional development environment with uh, um, Belt and Road Initiative, but not an alternative monetary and financial system. The bilateral trade between China and Russia occurs without the dollar as intermediate currency. But this is not an alternative monetary system, but a protection from financial United States attacks. Second, the China international payment system was created to facilitate cross-border trade with the Yuan and for a higher use of domestic currencies between trade partners. But the inconvertible yuan, yuan is not a rival to United States dollar that dominates trade, invoicing, and reserves. And the idea from BRICS countries from a currency sounds unfeasible. <coughs> well, the main challenge for developing countries is to achieve a higher and a sustainable economic growth. And for this is necessary, one, counter cycle resources, and two, longer matured finance for substantial investments in old and new infrastructure. As uh, pointed out by um, um, uh, UNTAD, the financing needs to support the sustainable development goals are formidable and the infrastructure investment is the most important. Estimated, consider that there is a need for an increase from 2% to 6% of developed country, just uh, infrastructure investment. The main actors are national development banks in big countries and multilateral and regional development banks in small countries, particularly through South-South cooperation infrastructure as for instance what you say in China Lead Belt Road Initiative. National and multilateral development banks are the key players for long-term financing from their own funding sources and for leverage additional sources including private. But although this leverage is always possible, the known Estimates on green projects, for instance, reveal a very low leverage ratio for multilateral and domestic public banks. Except in some lucrative areas, financing infrastructure comes from public, public sources. For instance, despite political commitment on climate change in developed countries and many market innovations, um, public finance accounted for the majority of loans. As Stephanie Griffith Jones point out, the shortage of enough funding to finance the massive investment for the structural transformation toward a green economy is a big challenge. And for this endeavor, private financial markets are fraught. Moreover, for a structural change in poor countries, there is a clear understanding that in many areas, decarbonization and green investment in agriculture, forestry, and land use, and the accelerate phase out of coal, that is a good challenge for Asia and African countries, will require concessional and debt-free finance. The low share of grants and the predominance of non-concessional loans in multilateral public finance increase the risks of indebted countries. Other forms of mobilization resource, as in carbon markets, although they can support fiscal resources to green investments, they are not an alternative to the large public investment. One key problem, international financing for projects in developing countries is the exchange risk generated by the mismatch between loans denominators in nights in dollars and revenues and domestic currencies. After 
let's uh, talk about um, public development banks. After a great wave of privatization, uh, many new uh, public banks were created in the last decade. Nowadays, as someone has pointed out before, we have um, um, 500 uh, something. And the annual finance from uh, those banks are about 10% uh, of world investment. Um, this is very common story, there's no to say, but uh, for instance, for China, for Brazil, Korea, or India, um, this is the story of industrialization and the story of uh, infra infrastructure investment was the story of those banks, national banks. For instance, in, in the case of China, is the biggest bank, much bigger than, than the World Bank, is the China Developed Bank. Uh, and a, a lot of initiatives are very, very interesting. For instance, uh, we have in Brazil, uh, in this, in case this Amazon phone administered by BN, there's um, an important um, uh, source of, of funds. But uh, I, I would like to make this point here, um, that uh, it's very important to consider that this stra strategic role uh, depends on more general development strategy adopted by the countries. As a major stockholder, governments assert a dominant role on their actions, but they can follow a development strategy or they can follow a market conforming strategy. A good example occurred with Brazil, with uh, being the S. Just, just to see this um, Graphic. This is the Bendez loans in percent of GDP. Look at this. And this is, is after this is when uh, Dilma Rousseff was um, put out of the government, and then this this is this is to say that. Uh, um, to have a, a good uh, um, um, public bank depends strategically on the inclination of the government. Without that, there's no. The same happened with the multilateral development banks. Uh, the same disjunctive is presented with multilateral banks. They can provide a, a counter cycle lending or they can follow a more conservative and market-conforming role. They can provide an adequate finance for sustainable development goals or act in a traditional approach to preserve their issue ratings in financial markets. The inclination of uh, these multilateral banks are particularly important for poor countries and particularly for the cooperation between South-South countries where regional banks can be a strategic and main source for finance infrastructure and concessional loans. I'd say that uh, um, according to, to Stern and co-authors, um, the, it, it, just related with this, this possibility to, to, to make an investment for green transition, I say that uh, this will require the tripling of uh, multilateral clim climate finance to something like uh, uh, 150 billions within the next five years. And it's, it's, it's an amazing amount. And, and new instruments, uh, are including hybrid capital and risk transfer instruments and promotes of channeling of IMF special draw through MDB. But uh, the main limit is their subordination on international capital markets for issuing their bonds. Most multilateral follow the traditional market conforming approach. They are very conservative and to preserve their AA issue ratings and reluctant to provide sufficient concessional finance to support activities in low income countries. Well, I, I don't have uh, uh, much time to, uh, 
to make a comparison, but uh, I can uh, make some few remarks on the, uh, at what difference makes this uh, new development bank uh, and uh, this Asian uh, infrastructure investment bank. Uh, I, they, they were created and motivated to find the uh, new directions. This is, uh, as, as Untad said, the disillusionment of developing countries with government structures, patterns of lending and conditionalities associated with lending by the Bretton Woods institutions. But, uh, and, and the creation was motivated by that. Um, but uh, so far, uh, you would say that uh, um, they are not big enough. They, they are small, medium-sized bank. And for instance, just to to make this um, the comparison, in 2021, they just um, um, was something like um, less than 5% or 6% of the, the, the World Bank and so that. So I, 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 I want to conclude I, I would say the conclusion because I don't have time. Um, I would say that um, face it with today's major challenges to finance the massive investment necessary for structural change. Developing countries rely essentially on public development banks and multilateral development banks. And but for big countries, national banks are the key players, but they are very dependent on political decisions. In relation to multilateral, um, the key issue is the provision of adequate, adequate resource to face international liquidity. But uh, despite rhetoric commitments with um, sustainable development goals, they are too tired to financial markets and risk agencies. There are some initiatives that would allow a reduction in food rates and costs, but to date they are quite limited. Regional or alternative banks as NDB and AIB are as well initiative, good initiative, but they are not big enough. But uh, with the countries closer, this is something expectation, but uh, I think that is true. Uh, closer to Chinese economics, uh, the outlook is more favorable. So thank you very much for this. <laughs> Do you hear me right? Yes, perfect. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It is a real honor to be here uh, in this panel with you and to be here in this conference uh, with so many people I admire both uh, academically and politically. I would like to focus my presentation on certain elements of the political economy underlying financial regulations particularly those related uh, to capital controls, something that Professor Gosch suggested yesterday to put some emphasis on. To this end, I will refer to three topics. First, the current situation in Latin America and the role of uh, development policies, particularly those related to financial regulation. Second, the political economy of the institutional context, both multilateral and bilateral, that I think widely restrict the policy space for financial regulation. And finally, some brief ideas, of course, about how to think a new financial regulation uh, mechanism and the political context for this in the periphery. I hope that these three uh, issues can provide us with some uh, clarity on how to think about the package of financial regulation for development. We are currently at a critical conjuncture in Latin America, where the decisions made today regarding trade financial and industrial policy will condition the regional growth pattern for the coming decades. Uh, today, the region is experiencing what uh, Jose Antonio Campo has recently called a new lost decade, where annual growth uh, since 2014 has been around 0.4%, similarly to the performance during the crisis of the 80s. 
This meager performance has been due to various shocks, such as the impact of the measure of uh, the COVID-19, as well as the crisis of surf, for example, in Venezuela. But equally important have been the longer term uh, trends facing the region, such as the premature deindustrialization of its productive matrix and the reprimarization of the export baskets, both uh, from the industrial restruction, destruction experience after the Washington Consensus and the shifts towards export of natural resources after the commodity boom based on Chinese demand, right, in the period between 2003 and 2014. As is already known, the Washington Consensus, although it did not include the dimension of financial deregulation at its inception, did imply that most countries in the region opened their capital accounts and liberalized their financial sector. Contrary to what uh, the orthodoxy expected, this opening provided a decade of great financial instabilities, starting with the tequila crisis in the mid-90s, the Brazilian crisis of 1999, the Argentinian crisis in 2001, and the impact of the Asian crisis throughout the region, which gave us a half decade of economic stagnation. The commodity boom generated, I think, an inertia effect on economic institutions and capital markets in particular. In countries such as Colombia, Chile, and Peru, for example, the post-Asian crisis period generated a deepening of the free trade and financial liberalization model. The region exported and financial elites sought to revitalize growth by accelerating trade and, in and integration through a wave of bilateral agreements with the US, with China, with the EU, uh, with the aim of the re reducing the transaction cost in terms of trade, investment, and capital flows. In this scenario, the growth of trade from Chinese demand generated an effect in which the discussions of industrial policy or finance financial regulation were limited by this new, uh, by this new abundance made out of copper, soil, uh, soy and oil. Chile, for example, experienced a closure of the discussions on the need of a new growth strategy due to the apparent trade boom. Why worry about regulating finances or making industrial policies if the economy was growing by a mere fact of having an export matrix in line with the inherited comparative advantages? This inertia in the internal political economy came hand in hand with the demand from the US, for example, to considerably reduce the policy space of the countries in the region to implement capital controls, selective subsidies, pro-developmental rules for foreign direct investment, etc. To this end, the negotiation of the FTAs in Latin America with the, EU, with the US, for example, was the classic compromise between better access to the US market in exchange for legally limiting the use of capital controls and pro-developmental rules to the US capital. While the elites of the countries of the region were focused on improving their access to the financial and good markets of the core countries, such as the US, the cost in terms of restricting the instrument, such as capital controls, were seen as a minor cost in the face of greater access to accumulation spaces. Chile, my country, is a perfect example of this. In the 90s, the democratic government successfully applied an unremunerated reserve requirement for the entry of capital into the country in order to intervene in the type of capital that entered, favoring long-term capital over speculative capital, and allowing the exchange rate not to suffer from changes that would undermine export competitiveness in the face of capital flow instabilities. The FTA with the, EU's, with the US say eliminated the possibility of applying this instrument, leaving only a restricted space for it use. And the same can be seen in other cases such as Colombia. Furthermore, these restrictions are no longer subject to state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanisms, as in, for example, the WTO GATS, but to international investor state dispute settlement tribunals. As is already known, these tribunals involve legal and a, a legal architecture that is particularly beneficial to claimants and mainly affects the autonomy of states. In this scenario, the region is centering a new conjuncture of as the famous economist Carlos Diaz Alejandro said in reference to the natural resource boom in the early 20th century, a lottery not of natural resources, but of minerals, such as lithium, copper, nickel, etc. The growing demand for critical minerals for the energy transition underway in economies such as the EU, China, and the USA, the USA means that the region is beginning to see the entry of new capital and increased trade ties. The key point here is that this new market power from Latin America opens a window of opportunity for the region to create a pro-development trade and financial architecture 
so that the potential foreign investment and trade boom around mineral inputs comes hand in hand with a framework of policies and rules that allows mining re re revenues to go to investment in local productive capacities, that allows local suppliers to be included in the production chain, that technology is transferred from foreign investment to the local economy, and that ensures productivity and productive and non-speculative capital flows and along with defending a competitive exchange rate to avoid the debt disease. Only in this way can the current scenario open up the possibility of initiation a path for sustainable development over time and not repeat what has been the trend in the region. Periods of exogenous growth followed by long period of profound stagnation. This kind of peripheral kind of growth of our peripheral capitalism as Raul Previch would have said. However, in order to create such an architecture, substantive changes in the current trade and financial regime are required, evidently. First, it is key to diversify the sources of access to financial capital, especially from regional sources in the global south, such as the BRICS development banks, CAF in Latin America, or the Asian Development Bank. In turn, it is key to strengthen national development banks, as in Brazil's own case, and potentially to establish regulation for private banks to allocate part of their capital to long-term projects. Capital controls can be used not only to promote financial stability, but also to direct inflows and long-term flows of capital to certain types of economic activities. In this sense, these controls can function as an industrial policy, policy as has been the case in Taiwan, in Vietnam, or Pakistan, where they have been used to privilege domestic over foreign uh, investments uh, or for the reinvestment of foreign private surpluses in key domestic sectors. But for that, it is key to renegotiate trade agreements, either by excluding artic articles related to financial regulations, as has on already been the case of the agreements between Chile and the EU or the US and South Korea, or by eliminating ISDS from trade agreements, as in the case of the EU nowadays, and the USMCA, uh, particularly between Mexico and Canada. Finally, to prevent, to prevent a race to the bottom in regulatory matters, the region has the chance to establish some kind of regional mechanism, or the possibility at least, to establish common regulations on capital flows. Colombia and Chile, for example, have already opened up to collaborate in discussing global tax agenda, led by uh, Professor Jose Antonio Campo, right? While there is a long way to go here and the talks are just beginning, uh, they mark a potential path to include the agenda of homogenizing criteria for collective capital controls, taking advantage of the growing market power of countries intensive in critical minerals. All of the above, all of the things that I have said, may be, reasonable, may be a reasonable agenda for a developmentalist architecture of financial regulation, but it can only be condensed into public policy if it is able to materialize in a political coalition strong enough to implement it successfully vis-a-vis -vis an economic and political elite and international diplomacy. You, you don't know how important is that in the Latin America, uh, particularly from, north, uh, from the global north. I'm not going to enter into that. That have vested interest in the type of financial and trade openness in the region. This implies an urgent task, which is to uh, know how to connect this agenda of financial regulation for development with the desire for decent and sophisticated jobs for the working classes with the desires of the middle classes for economic stability and protection against international crisis and financial instabilities, for the support for productive diversification and export growth of small businesses, which account for a key part in the regional employment. And finally, for productive and technological change for industrial companies that still exist as the, the productive destruction during the Washington consensus and afterwards. I believe that this agenda of, uh, of financial regulation, for example, can perfectly connect with the desire of those social groups that have been excluded from the neoliberal agenda, that are eager for a concrete and pragmatic agenda of change, and that if they have clear goals and objectives, can be the agents that carries these progressive agendas on their shoulders in the face of a growing reactionary and neoliberal agenda that seems to be emerging again in the region. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for three or four questions.
Thank you, Chair. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, uh, my name is Luis Eduardo Melin. I'm Brazilian, and um, I've worked for the past 20 years in um, development banking, especially international development banking, both in the Brazilian National um, Development Bank and more recently at the NDB in Shanghai. And um, I, I have a question that I would like to, to put to the three panelists um, because it's a, it, it actually comes from a little bit from everything that each of them uh, presented here. Um, we are seeing that on the one hand, yes, it's uh, development banks have an important role as financial agents for monies that will be uh, utilized for um, important challenges uh, in terms of uh, capital investment in the developing world. However, uh, this equation has another side. You, you, on the one hand, you have to provide the funding for the banks, that's okay. But on the other hand, you have to have someone who's going to take the money and take the risk of making the very heavy um, investment commitments uh, for both for climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation and for uh, more general infrastructure, right? And this is, this, is a, this is a big problem because when we're talking about uh, less developed countries, obviously um, it will be quite, uh, in, in spite of the continuing rhetoric about uh, corporations, private corporations that are interested in uh, footing this particular bill uh, in order to be able to uh, exploit the utilities in the future, uh, uh, this is more of a mythical scenario than uh, an actual one. It's it's usually uh, private corporations are interested in public service utilities and infrastructure. Once the infrastructure is already in place, as the the big capital commitment has already been made, um, so. For LDCs, usually it comes down to the state, uh, most often. In uh, middle-income countries, however, um, this, there is a, a big pressure, uh, and it's a political and ideological pressure, that the, the, the private sector must be present in one way or another. It's not that in middle-income countries there are more candidates, private candidates, to take the risk and to make this, these huge investments that the various panelists showed that uh, are necessary for to meet the challenges in, in the years ahead in the global south. It's not that there is this appetite on the part of private investors. It's just that uh, the political consensus is more and more one that, oh no, you cannot uh, put the, 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 this onus, this, this this burden on the state because this will uh, increase indebtedness and you know uh, uh, we, we have to control public finance otherwise God knows what will happen. So what we're seeing at the moment is something that um, a lot have been discussed in the G20 about how um, development banks and uh, multilateral development banks particularly should work how they should operate, what criteria they should use. But um, when you look at the size of those, uh, at the side of those who uh, have to take the money and, and apply it and invest it, uh, there hasn't been so much discussion. And we are faced with this, with the following picture. On the one hand, um, you don't have enough um, private, large private corporations really with a huge appetite for infrastructure uh, investments in the global south. Um, they would like to exploit the utilities once they're in place, but they don't want to build them and to uh, put that in their balance sheet, all of those loans that are necessary in order to do that. Second, um, that not only those countries, uh, uh, the countries in the global south need infrastructure, but they are now being pressured actively uh, 
to, for making all the, the climate change investments on top of the regular infrastructure. We now have the, it's mandatory that you do the, the, the green infrastructure. Uh, even though, uh, uh, even, even now, uh, subsistence agriculture is being, is being targeted as, as being something that is menacing to the environment. So, uh, I would like to, to ask the panelists to, to, uh, make a, um, a projection or uh, an estimation, each of them, realistically, without any sudden changes in the international monetary and financial scene that may or may not um, materialize. I'm, I'm talking relatively short term, five to ten years. Um, where do we see the investment in infrastructure going in the global south given that you have the problem with the MDBs that has been exhaustively discussed by the G20, but you also have the problem that governments are not supposed to foot the bill because they are not supposed to raise indebtedness. And if you create other mechanisms, like for instance, China has done with uh, Belt and Road Initiative, then immediately there are cries all over the world about uh, entrapment, a, a debt trap, that uh, these countries are being, uh, the countries that do that are being led uh, down a ruinous path of a debt trap. So uh, how do you see realistically, uh, if, if we imagine a, a G20 meeting 10 years from now, uh, showing the figures about infrastructure investment and uh, more particularly also in, inside that bracket, inf, um, climate change inv um, investment in infrastructure. What are the figures yes. likely to be Sorry, compared the, to the, the organizers to already this one? signaling me that? That's just it. Thank That's you so it. much. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another one. Well, it was a large question, so we can actually use it, this a lot. So, uh, thank you so much for it. So we can start in the same order, please. Well, I think. Uh, we should question the premise here to say that to have a to be in a situation where public investment uh, is not possible is not desirable because it entails borrowing is is uh, is the problem that we've been discussing and i think one has to find a way out of that basic problem and find a, a, a you know uh, move into a future where public investments are possible. Uh, so that's my first point. So, so I, I do think that uh, um, that uh, dealing with climate change mitigation and adaptation require large scale public investments. I see that in the current situation, doing that in a lot of uh, developing countries and these developed countries uh, entails borrowing and that's a problem but that's the problem that we've been discussing uh, but I also want to point to the fact that a lot of what is being uh, uh, sort of labeled as as uh, green investments and climate in, uh, related re related investment is actually a lot of it is accounting jugglery it's accounting jugglery, uh, labeling a lot of businesses' usual expenditure and investments as as climate expenditure, and that is not going to wash. That's not solving the problem that you are uh, trying to solve. So, so I think it requires uh, a big break in the way we've been thinking about climate finance, and I think uh, this basically comes on top of all the issues that we've been discussing for the last three days, and as you know additional challenges that one needs to i mean additional problems that are created on account of the the constraints that the current global financial architecture imposes on 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 poor countries thank you thank you <laughs> Melin, i think that's a you 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 ask a, a very very difficult question because uh what one saying here, um, all this seminar, um, connected with the supply side of uh, adequate loans for 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 growth, for investment, for infrastructure investment. 
but uh, you are asking about the conditions, the, all the institutions that can coordinate the reception of these loans and adjust it for um, correct purposes and investments and, uh, and put national um, and uh, incentives and um, mechanisms of control um, in order to, to make this uh, profitable. Um, uh, well, this, this is what I said, that uh, developed banks are not without a development government. This is just to say. This is the, in the case of being there, this is a, is a good story of this. So the, um, um, those banks can be much more market conforming and just uh, worry about um, ratings and all that. And um, this, is, this is, is a point. And, um, a, 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 or to make some, a lot of difficulties to get this money and uh, the, the government does not have the organizations, institutions just to circumvent these this difficulties, the bureaucratic difficulties and all that. It, it, it depends on the existence of negotiator, depends on the institutions, the national institutions and all that. So that we are talking about uh, the supply side of the problem, but um, um, there is the demand side of the problem. It's the national government and what the, they will do. And uh, this is uh, the, the other question that uh, is really necessary, but is not uh, addressed uh, so far in these conferences. Thank you. Uh, thank Just one uh, point I will add to the comments that my, that my colleague just uh, gave. I would just put, put into the table that in the current negotiations between the EU and, and Latin America for Chile, for example, Mercosur or Mexico, there is a growing, growing debate between the, the offers that the EU is making in terms of finance for green transition and green transformation uh, in exchange for uh, open the door for Latin, of Latin American countries to the access of lithium and uh, or copper, for example, and even more important to reduce the capacity of the state to implement policies, for example, to select certain uh, capitals to invest that have more capacity to establish linkages or productive policies, right? So I think that is a key point that is currently being debated here, you know, in, in Mercosur and with Mexico, and we also had that uh, with Chile, and the key point that the EU was offering was exactly the financial uh, finance, finance for uh, the green transition in exchange of these very important policies that we could have in order to open the door for this uh, green transformation being a, a source of productive uh, industrialization, right? So we can talk that about that later, yeah. Okay, guys, so another round of applause to our fellow panelists, thanking them very much. So I think we're done. We'll have lunch now. Okay. See you soon.